as many of you will be aware, of the past three months, we've been teaching on what it looks like to live in the freedom that God has called us to in his son Jesus. And our teaching has been based around Paul's letter to the Galatians. We looked, or we have looked, at the liberating fact that our freedom comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus works or Jesus plus the law, but it's Jesus alone. And all this was covered by Paul when writing that letter in chapters 1 and 2. We went on to see in chapters 3 and 4 that this freedom in Christ is available for everyone. Everyone who believes. And how Jesus has one large multi-ethnic community, one large multi-ethnic family. Over, over several weeks now, we've, been, we've clearly seen that we can only fully live in this freedom that Jesus has purchased for us as we are filled and walk in the Spirit. And Paul covers this in chapter 5 of Galatians in, in great detail. Over the past eight weeks, we've been looking at the fruit of the Holy Spirit that Paul speaks of in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Let us be reminded that the fruit of what the fruit of the Spirit looks like and what it looks like to live in this freedom that we've been called to in Jesus. Each aspect of that fruit is part of God's character. And so, therefore, as we are filled and walk in the Spirit, we're becoming more and more like him. I remember weeks ago sharing on love and agape love, God's love, because, uh, you know, as you know, it, it starts, for the fruit of the Spirit is love. And uh, I shared on this agape love and how God's love permeates our hearts and minds by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the bottom line is that you and I can't produce this fruit in ourselves, and I suggest we don't even try to. The fruit can only be produced in our lives as we constantly lay down and deny this sinful, the sinful nature. And for me, the absolute key and the crunch is in Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To me, this is the absolute key, the absolute key. An old friend of mine who was part of this church for many years, who's now gone to heaven, um, used to tell me that it was a one-off experience, this, in Galatians 2.20. And to be honest, I can't accept that because I have to keep coming back to the cross. And I have to keep coming back to the cross for that forgiveness. And I have to keep coming back to the cross in order that I might deny myself and keep surrendering to Christ. 
I believe it's ongoing. It's ongoing for each one of us. <clears throat> and I believe this in Galatians 2.20 is massive and so key to each one of us moving forward. And I can't emphasise it enough. I really can't. And it's as we move, as we deny ourselves and as we're filled and walk in the spirit, that we know that freedom in our lives. And clearly, we deny ourselves and we surrender to the Lord because we love him and we want to please him and we want to honour him. John Stott, the great Bible scholar and preacher of the last century, who went to heaven about five years ago, and he was well in his 90s when he went to heaven. This is what he said, and I, I thought it was really good, worth bringing out. It's a wonderfully liberating experience when the desire to please God overtakes the desire to please ourselves. When love for others display, displaces love for self, true freedom is not a freedom from responsibility to God and others to live for myself, but freedom from myself in order to live for God and others. I know it's, it's quite a mouthful, however, it, it's, it's really good stuff when you think about it. And, and as I thought about this and contemplated it yesterday, I thought, what this is saying to me is, it's not all about me. It's not all about me. First, it's about him, and then it's about others. And Galatians 5 talks about serving one another in love. This morning, we're looking, though, at the seventh aspect of the fruit that Paul lists. And I know there's nine, and I should have been speaking two or three weeks ago, but um, Rachel Hickson was able to come, and so I put myself on the back burner. But uh, we're going to look this morning at faithfulness. In the original Greek, the word is pistis. Faithfulness, loyalty, courage to be utterly reliable and true to your word. When you start to look at faithfulness, I believe there's only one place to start, and that is to look at God's faithfulness. And so that's where we're going to begin this morning. We're going to begin by looking at God's faithfulness to us. First, we see his great faithfulness in creation. In Genesis 6, because of the human race's corruption and wickedness on the earth, we read that God brought a flood on the earth. And we can read about this in Genesis 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. And the Lord was sorry that he'd made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the earth, for I am sorry that I have made him. But Noah found favour in the eyes of the Lord. And then we go on and we see and we read this in Genesis 9. Genesis 9, 18, 18, 8 to 17. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and your descendants after me, 
And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, all that will go out of the ark, every beast of, of the, the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all, earth, all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for, perpet for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud. It shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again flood and destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is a sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. And so whenever we see that rainbow, whenever we see that rainbow, it's a great reminder of the covenant that God made first with Noah. And it speaks so much of his faithfulness. Our God is true and he is faithful to his word, to his promise. And this is so clear despite human faithlessness and the way that so often man treats the earth. We see God's faithfulness and God's promise, don't we? Secondly, we see God's great faithfulness to his people. Just turn over, if you've got your Bibles or you're using your phone, to Genesis 12. God made a covenant with Abram. Now the Lord has said to Abram, get out of your country, from your kindred, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Covenant in the Hebrew is from the word bereth, meaning a bond, a binding relationship rooted in a commitment that includes promises and obligations. Just let me read this in verses three and four. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in, and in, all, in all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Aaron. Abram, or as we know him as Abraham, followed the Lord's word. He acted in obedience. He walked by faith, and this was counted to him as righteousness. And if you're in Christ this morning, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. And that's what we're told in Galatians 3, 29, that we are heirs according to the promise. The promise that God made to Abraham, the man of faith, was so wonderfully fulfilled in Jesus. And we are included in, whether we be Jew or Gentile, we are included in through faith 
in Jesus alone. Our God is faithful and true to his promise. Now, the Bible doesn't sugar things up at all. It doesn't sugarcoat things at all. And as you go on reading Genesis, you see that Abraham failed on a couple of occasions. In fact, he lied about Sarah, his wife, out of fear. He also took the provision of a son into his own hands as he went with the Egyptian uh, servant girl rather than praying and waiting on God to act. However, in it all, faith was the over overriding principle of his life. Whilst on holiday, I was reading the Old Testament book of Lamentations. I wonder, <laughs> I wonder if any of you have recently read Lamentations. Anybody here? Oh, George has. Yeah, George has been reading Lamentations. I've got to confess, I don't know how you went on, George, but I have to confess that um, it wasn't, or I didn't find it the most gripping book in the Bible. Uh, in many ways, it was quite sad as I was reading Lamentations. And the back, for those of you who don't know, the background is that Jerusalem had been invaded by the Babylonians and the city was destroyed. It was in ruins. For over 40 years, the prophet Jeremiah had warned Judah of God's forthcoming judgment due to their sin, due to their rejection and abuse. However, Judah didn't take heed at all, took no notice. And Jeremiah, known as the weeping prophet, laments over the apparent tragedy. And we, we read of this in the writings. However, however, in chapter 3, verse 23, Jeremiah is still able to proclaim God's great faithfulness to his people. This is what we read. 21 onwards. This I recall to mind. Therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion. Therefore I have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. Jeremiah, in the midst of it all, is able to say, I do have hope. Because of your mercies, we are not consumed. Your compassions, they fail not. They fail not because of the abundance of your great love. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord's faithfulness to his creation. The Lord's faithfulness to his people. I'm not somebody who ever stands here and wants to be negative. I believe when I stand here, I'm here to proclaim God's positive truth to his people. And so I never want to be negative when I stand here. And I certainly will not knock other people at all when I stand here. However, the 21st century culture that we see before us today is a culture that increasingly, increasingly says no to God and his ways and says yes to itself. And you know, this needs to be challenged. In our culture today, marriage 
and family life is so undermined. And it is God's design for the majority of humankind. Somehow, man seems to know better. A retired footballer who has recently been involved in a court case for abuse and alleged assault recently admitted in this last fortnight, he recently admitted to being a love cheat and never, ever has he been faithful. He he admits that. What a place to be. When you pick up the morning paper, how many accounts are there regarding infidelity and unfaithfulness? The media so often dresses it all up and makes it acceptable and attractive. But the truth is, it isn't. It's bad news that causes so much hurt, so much pain, so much heartache, and so much confusion into people's lives. And in this present culture as Christians, we need to stand for marriage and for family life because it's God's heart and it's God's plan. And because it's God's heart and because it's God's plan, it's liberating. Here at King's, we periodically run a marriage course. And it's a great course. And if you haven't been on it, I commend it to you. And it will strengthen you in your marriage and in your relationship. And... uh, If you're interested, have a word with Keith and Gwen because they they run that course and and it's a really good course. I've got the book at home and Jessica and I have have gone through that book and it's a a great book and a great course. So I want to commend that to you because it's something that we put on here in the life of the church to help people in married life. At this point, I want to share and testify for a moment regarding God's goodness and faithfulness over the last 40 plus years. Jessica and I had planned to marry and did marry in the May of 1982. However, when planning the wedding, the Lord had other plans. And uh, that was the beginning of the work here in this place. And uh, that work began on the January of 1982 as we were married in the May of 82. So this place is all we've ever known. (laughs) Um, When we began, I did know the call of God and had some amazing prophetic words spoken over us. However, in those early days, I have to admit that I was quite a reluctant leader in those early days. It was all new stuff and I was quite reluctant. In it all, I want to pay tribute to some faithful and loyal men and women of God in this place. Not least Jessica, who is an outstanding leader in her own right, who served in the team in these latter years. This place and this people run through my veins. And I'm not going anywhere. (laughs) I'm not going anywhere, God willing. Only God knows that. I can't say that with utter certainty. Only God knows that. In saying this, I will be 70 next August. (laughs) Well, no, I'm not there. I'm not there. (laughs) And I see the faithfulness of God in raising younger men and women in this place. (laughs) Raising younger men and women for the future. 
to run with the baton. Men and women with great gifting and sound character to lead the work. And I just ask that as we go through a period of transition, that you, as the people of God, pray uh, with us on this one. In it all, though, I have to say that I've known the goodness and the faithfulness of God. And I believe, looking back, there's been some right difficult situations to have to deal with. I was saying to someone the other day, don't be a leader. Don't seek after it unless God firmly puts it on your heart because there's no glamour in it. It's, it's about having a servant heart serving the people of God. And there have been some difficult situations that we've had to deal with over the years. And you do get misrepresented. And there's some things that you can't say that others can. Um, and there's a place that you've just got to trust in that. But I, in it all, I can testify to knowing the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Finally, I want to begin to conclude. And there is a question that I want to ask. What does it look like for us, the people of God, to be a faithful people? What does it look like for us to be a faithful people? First of all, I want to say, be faithful in your thoughts. It all begins in the mind. The mind is an absolute battlefield. It really is. And it's in the mind that the enemy attacks. It really is. And very often, he puts all sorts of rubbish. We can be going along merrily. And suddenly a thought will come in and we'll think, where has that flipping come from? And we know where it's come from. And we do one of two things at that point. We either cut it in the mighty name of Jesus or we allow it to dwell on us. And if we allow it to dwell, we'll go all over the place. And it can utterly destroy us. But cut, <coughs> cut it in the mighty name of Jesus. <coughs> and I want to say, one of the, when it comes to this, one of the scriptures that I've found so, so helpful is Philippians 4.8, where Paul, when writing to the Philippian church, says, brothers and sisters, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So, be faithful in your thoughts. And when those alien thoughts come, cut them in the mighty name of Jesus. Secondly, this is on the practical side, be faithful to your word. Yeah. In other words, as the people of God, let's not make rash promises that we, we never fulfill. How easy it can be to, to say, oh, I must arrange a date with you. Or... I'll contact you, and it never comes off. Let's be faithful people to our word. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, let your yes be yes and your no be no. I remember, I'll never forget it actually, it's something that stuck in my mind. I remember when there were just a handful of, of us in the cricket club and uh, meeting on a Sunday morning, and Martin actually spoke on it. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And it's always stuck in my mind. 
Thirdly, be faithful in prayer. How easy it can be to say to someone after the meeting who might be having a chat and how easy it can be to say to someone who's struggling, oh, I'll pray for you. I'll make a point of praying for you. And it goes out of our mind. And the Holy Spirit really challenged me on this a year or two ago. And uh, I've got to say that as he's challenged me, I've sought to follow a, follow on that one. And, and if I've said I'll pray for somebody, I've tried, I've really sought after doing that because uh, I was challenged on it a year or two ago. And I believe that the finest thing that you can ever do for a person is to take them before God's throne and lift them before his throne. And you know, I know it, you could say it's a cliche, but prayer does change things. It, it changes situations and it changes people's hearts. And finally, let's be faithful in our actions. <coughs> we know that we're not saved by works. We know that. But we are called to good works. We're told that in Philippians. And church happens and the kingdom advances and increases through the availability of God's people and their actions as the Holy Spirit takes us and uses us. And so let's be faithful also in our actions. I'm going to pray now, and then I've got a prophetic word to bring um, that God gave me the other morning. Where is it? Ah, it's there. Um, <clears throat> often as I'm lying in bed and coming round, that, as I said the other week, that quite 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, I find God often speaks to me. And um, he spoke to me the first morning this last week, and then he spoke to me, I think, on the, it was the Monday and then the Tuesday. And so I thought, I better get this written down. <coughs> and when I start writing, if God's given me something, I have this phrase in, in our family. I say, oh, the pen, the pen wouldn't stop. And he's on his, he's on his theology course uh, down in Nottingham this week, David. But uh, he, he takes the rip out of that remark, as you can well and truly imagine. But, um, but yeah, the pen didn't stop uh, this week. And so can we just pray together and then I'll bring this prophetic word. Lord, we thank you that you are such a faithful God. You've been faithful to each one of us in so many, many ways. And as we look back, we thank you for your faithfulness on creation. And we thank you for your faithfulness to your people as we've been reminded this morning throughout every generation. And we come and we give you thanks. Lord, help us to be a faithful people in our thoughts. Help us, Holy Spirit, in our thought life. Help us, Lord, by your Spirit to be a people who are faithful to your word and faithful to our word, Lord. When we say we'll do something, Lord, may we be a people who does it. May we not be a people who just makes rash promises. Lord, make us a people who are faithful in prayer.
and help us by your spirit to do what you call us to do in our actions, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we can't live this Christian life in our own strength. We thank you, Lord, that it's as we are filled with the Holy Spirit and as we walk in the Spirit that we produce the fruit in our lives and in our character. Help us, Lord, ever to be reminded of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Just want to bring this word that, that God has given me, and it's for this church. My people stand together in unity for my plans and purposes for this place are great. You are not a small, insignificant, forgotten place and people. For you are a lever, an handle to the doors that I am opening and will open. Not only here, but far beyond. See, I have sent out from this place in the past and I will continue to do so. In this season of new beginnings, walk in unity and purpose. Keep my son Jesus at the very centre. Watch, see my people. Walk close to me, for as you do so, the latter will far outweigh the former. My people, embrace the new beginnings. Follow the leading of my spirit. My people, do not be influenced swayed by the spirit of this age, by the pressures of man that will come. I call you to walk in love and compassion. However, I call you to be faithful to my word, standing firmly on Jesus. I believe very firmly that God gave me that word for this people here and uh, weigh it and uh, I can say no more.